we're also on live so welcome to those listening live okay so oh so already six questions only six already six okay let's get started oh wow well. okay right, let's go to the top Imagine me, it worked for me, at least. Okay. Uh, apologies to Ajahn and Ben, I did not join yesterday. Okay. I felt that I was exhausted. Okay. No. Matthias. No, not Matthias. Someone oh, else. Okay. Dear Ajahn. Dear Ajahn, wow. The best feeling ever. During and a few minutes after the last meditation. Session, my body felt completely frozen. So does the mind. There were two or three thoughts came up, but disappeared. Extraordinary feeling when my mind went to the enlightened mode. My heart felt gratitude, gratitude to you, Ajahn Brahm and Venerable Chanda, for giving me this opportunity with Metta, Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. Yes, yeah, so sometimes that meditation really works, of uh, just imagining you're the Buddha. And it gives you like a feeling for how free, how peaceful you can be. The next question, I'll do a couple here so you can okay. relax. Do you practice puja? I feel this I feel this something that I would like to do as part of my practice. Not to request blessings, but to make offerings to the Buddha. Would this be something that you would endorse? Many thanks to you both. Yes, you can do that. It's uh, I've adapted giving blessings to the Buddha because I don't have much to give myself. Although that when we do some ceremonies, uh, flowers, incense, candles, whatever it is, uh, are supplied by somebody, and they're handed to the monks and the nuns, and we go sadhu sadhu. We rejoice in those offerings and then put them in front of the um, the shrine. But one of the nicest things to do puja, nicest ways to do puja, is when you are meditating, when you sit down and just do a meditation, that's a wonderful offering you can do to the Buddha. I often teach that, that you have half an hour or an hour, you sit down and you make the, your meditation as an offering to your teacher, the Buddha. And I found that very helpful because it makes me give more importance and value to the meditation. And it's not what I'm going to get out of this, it's what I can give. And I'm doing this in memory of my teacher. So that's a good thing to do, Pujas. So the first part of the next one's for you, and the second okay. one's for me. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to meet Ajahn Brahm. He is one of the people I have promised myself to know in my lifetime. Now I'd like to ask Ajahn Brahm what we what are the books? what are the books to read in which his practice is well explained? It's the book of your own heart, the book of your own practice. Yes, I've written some books, and one of the first books which I wrote, uh, you know, the, the uh, mindfulness, bliss, and beyond. I did that many years ago, and now that if I would write it again, I would just change a few little details there. One of the best books which I have written was The Art of Disappearing. That is, I think, much better. And when it comes to what the practices are, where it's well explained, this is where you read something, you practice it, and after you practice it, you can understand what was written much better. It takes a while for you to realize that what you read, we always interpret what we read. And when we interpret, we always add things to what we read. And once we've had some experience and practice, we find out what those words really meant. So the second part of the question is for Maya Chanda. I would like to ask Ven Chanda, where can I find inspiration to do inner reflection and understand how to change my intentions and motivations and cultivate more virtues, as she said yesterday? Thank you. So inspiration to do that. 
I would say, first of all, hanging around wise people and noticing that the way that they live and maybe taking inspiration from them, their generosity, their humility, the way that they serve, and also your own friends and family. You know, you can just practice focusing on their goodness, their good qualities, even over and above the things that irritate you. You know, like, for example, one thing is with families, sometimes our families irritate us. And just now we were talking about that. And one of the people here said, oh, well, maybe they were just having a bad day. So this is always a nice thing to do is to give people the benefit of the doubt and to see that maybe, you know, they're struggling with something themselves and it's really not about you. So that's one really nice way to kind of let people off the hook, so to speak, so that you can actually practice seeing things in a different way and making your mindfulness more flexible and um, adjusting it. And then uh, another thing that I'd like to share is this really beautiful passage in um the Upakilesa Sutta and also, which is the other one, where it talks about um, Kimbala, Anuruddha and Nandiya, three very wonderful monks in the Buddha's day. Of course, there might have been three very wonderful nuns also living together in harmony. But the nice thing here was that they chose each other for company and they went to live in a little monastery on their own so that they could practice together. And in there, it talks, the Buddha comes to see them one time and asks how they're living together and how they're establishing their mindfulness, how they're practicing. And they actually say that the way that they're practicing this mindfulness and getting established in their meditation is by um, looking out for each other and basically acting as though they were um, three in body, but one in mind. So, for example, they say that when they come back from the arms round, whoever comes back first sets out everything nicely for the others and whoever finishes last puts everything away nicely. So there's none of this. It's your turn. It's my turn. I did it yesterday. Why does he always come last or first on purpose <laughs> or middle on purpose? So they do less. And then um, they get so happy about this because they keep reflecting on their good fortune. And um, there's this lovely phrase in that sutta that says, um, Something like, uh, uh, what great, for was it? Um, how fortunate I am or something to have such wise and noble companions in the holy life. What a great gain it is for me. What a great gain that I'm living with such virtuous companions. So they reflect in this way and they bring up this beautiful joy and happiness in their mind and in their heart so that when they meditate they easily get into deep meditation and eventually the buddha comes and finds out that they're already fully enlightened so it's that harmony that we create in our lives that's really important so if we can use our minds in ways that increase that harmony it's very good and lastly i would like to say don't forget yourself so because the buddha said it's very important to reflect on your own virtues as well and he called that chaganusati. So bringing up anything that you've done in the day or maybe in the last five minutes or in the last week that makes you feel happy about your life and that it's going in a good direction. So any little act of kindness. And if you can't think of anything, you can also think of any time that you restrained yourself from ill speech or from doing something that could have harmed somebody and really contemplate on that. Not in a sense of, oh, this is me that's good or bad, but just in a sense of cause and effect. This is the outcome of doing good. It makes me happy. It makes me glad. And really give yourself that space, you know, to reflect because we so often just see our faults and, you know, don't notice the qualities that we have. So that's a few ideas. Have you got any other ideas, Adja? No, that's good. Okay. Next. Today I experience deep peace, wonderful, followed by such an intense pleasure that I became scared. Ah, oh. there were no lights, just the pleasurable feeling in the body and mind simultaneously. The breath was also still there. It's really so intense it is hard to find the beauty in it. It, it feels like completely losing control and losing myself. Wonderful. I tried programming my mindfulness not to get scared, but it keeps on happening. Any advice? Look, it's wonderful to lose oneself and to lose one's body. And after a while, when it comes up again, if it keeps on happening, go a little bit deeper into it every time. It's only a little bit deeper every time, and you'll actually experience it more fully. And then you come out again, then the next time a little bit deeper. I usually gave a simile 
of like a child and mothers taking it to the swimming pool for the first time. And the little child has just learned how to stand on dry land. And now this water must be very frightening for a child. So the mother just puts just uh, maybe the feet into the water and takes it out again. Then puts the legs in the water and takes the child out. Then puts maybe half the body in the water and takes the child out. All the time, mothers protecting the baby and making it other child and making it feel safe. And then when the mother lets the child go fully into the water, then you can't get the child out again. It's just having such a wonderful time. And that's the same. You go deeper into that deep pleasure and powerful non-self feeling. And you just go a little bit deeper every time, a little bit deeper every time. And soon you get the moment when you go fully into it. You have a wonderful time. And it's hard to get you back out from the meditation. It doesn't matter. It's a beautiful experience and you deserve it. And I also just add one little thing, which might be, in my experience anyway, that at first when this kind of rapture arises, it is a little bit coarse. Like it can be quite agitating to the mind. So maybe that's what you mean by very intense. But after a while, it settles down. So it's just a natural process. After a while, the mind kind of gets its fill. And then the whole thing usually becomes a little bit more refined as the mind becomes increasingly at ease and at peace with it. You want to do that? Okay. Can you tell us more about energies? I'm not quite sure. Uh, what type of energies you are thinking about. But I do know that after a deep meditation, you do feel bodily, energetic, mental energy. You just get empowered. So that's one of the reasons why after a good meditation, it's hard to sleep. You don't want to sleep. You're just too alert and it's very safe. You don't need to sleep. And also your mind is very strong too. I'm not quite sure if that is what you mean. It's just a very short question. Mm. Okay. Dear Ajahn and Venerable, I was reflecting on Vedana. It seems to me that the neutral tone brings peace, perhaps as it does not agitate the sense as much. Please explain more about Vedana. Thank you very much for a great retreat. So yeah, I would probably agree with that. I've done a lot of meditation practice with um, experiencing Vedana and noticing the different feeling tones, you might say, or um, some people call it effective tone of experience. So this neutral tone is one of them. It's literally neither pleasant nor unpleasant in the Buddhist suttas. Um, and it's different from the pleasure and the painful experiences in that it is much more um subtle i would say so the buddha says that out of these vedanas i think it's somewhere in the suttas that the um unpleasant feeling or unpleasant experience has a tendency towards aversion the pleasant ones have a tendency to craving because we want more of them and the neither pleasant nor unpleasant can have a tendency towards delusion or ignorance simply because we usually fall asleep the mind has to be a lot more um, sharp and subtle in order to pick it up so sometimes when you're scanning through the body you might feel that there are parts of the body that you're not aware of sensations on but if you stay there longer the mind it starts to open up as the brightness and the lights of the mind kind of tune into it so something that you can't see at first later becomes manifest um, but this is just at the beginning of the practice and obviously, the whole idea of the path to samadhi is to start to tune into the pleasure, first of all, because the pleasure brings more energy and joy to the mind, and that empowers the mind to go deeper in the practice. And then gradually on the path towards the jhanas, that pleasure becomes more subtle. It becomes sukha, which is more like a contentment, I would say, um, like a contented sort of pleasure rather than that coarse rapture that we were talking about before. And that's the proximate cause for, um, for samadhi. And then as one would go through the jhanas, finally, the, the fourth jhana is much more the equanimity, which Ajahn Brahm would call contentment, Content, I think. Yes. But isn't that more like less of the pleasure, but more of the sort of, you could call it more the neither yeah. pleasure nor unpleasant? Yeah, but sometimes the Buddha does call it the pleasure of equanimity. Mm, yeah. 
the paper sukkah so it's still pleasurable yeah and even more so which yes. is the point here right that yes. it brings about more peace so yeah even as you go through the jhanas the less there is there the more peaceful it is even the less pleasure there is the more peaceful it is so actually equanimity or or which is related to this uh neither pleasant nor unpleasant tone of experience is actually one of the highest types of happiness i don't know if that's yes okay all right dear ajahn venerable yesterday at meditation i felt i got very small compressed and only about one foot tall sitting high from the cushion this happened when the sense of my body was calming this morning i felt a tightness roughly around the roof of my mouth not an actual physical sensation the tightness was coming from below expanding outwards it was interesting to observe but i thought i should continue observing the breath and this feeling slowly disappeared why do these strange body perceptions happening happen? Is it that the mind is trying to figure out the disappearing body? Should these be ignored? With attention, they get stronger. Also, it's halfway through this wonderful retreat and my mind has developed so much. I don't know how to show my gratitude to both of you. Thank you. Usually, I kind of explain this that when your body starts to disappear and your mind becomes strong, it's like the limitations which your perception put on you are released. You can see things that basically you're not supposed to see. You can view your body and the world in weird ways. One example which I gave uh, was many, many years ago when I was a young monk. I was walking through the monastery in Thailand and I saw that someone had put a, a towel on the drying line and the towel was jet black. It wasn't a dirty towel, it was like black, like a piece of coal. And I'd never seen a black colored towel before in my life. And I never knew any monk who had a black colored towel. And I just watched it for five minutes and wondering what was going on. And then it turned to white again. It always was a white towel, but my meditation was getting so strong that you could perceive something which was white was totally black. My mind's perception was not binding me so much. And I could be free and see things in ways I wasn't supposed to see. And that's the same when you look at your body. Sometimes you do feel that... You know, people are meditating and they feel they're rising up into the air. You are not levitating, but sometimes it feels that way or you're sinking into the ground. I would encourage you not to be afraid. When these things happen, just enjoy. It's a little bit of a free gift after all the hard work you've done with meditation. Now you can experience some interesting stuff. And after a while, a few minutes in meditation then you can let go of the the fantastic stuff and you get more peaceful and more joyful i think you deserve to have a bit of fun and games in your meditation <laughs> because sometimes it's very hard work right. ajahn bomb talked about the happiness in china during the meditation once the hindrances are suppressed if the hindrances are only temporarily suppressed in jhanas, does the happiness remain after the meditation when no longer in jhana, or is this happiness also impermanent? That once the hindrances are suppressed, they're only overcome, you know, when these enlightenment states happen, or they're called the fruits of the practice. But to attack to uh, enter a jhana, those hindrances have to be suppressed, and so temporarily they're not there. And because of that, the jhanas happen, and after one emerges from the jhanas, the happiness is there for a long time afterwards, together with the hindrances being absent. So this, but they come back later on. This is one of the reasons why if a person does have a wonderful jhana experience, 
Afterwards, they feel like they're walking on air. Afterwards, they can't see any hindrances. And sometimes they can even feel they're totally enlightened after emerging from a jhana. Unfortunately, those hindrances come back later. <laughs> there are many stories about that. But, oh, of course. Sorry? It's just yeah. all questions. Yeah, indeed. So I won't tell those stories. Uh, but you can read them in books like Mindfulness, Bliss and Beyond. But the happiness also vanishes after a while. The happiness is always going to be impermanent. Mm -hmm. Okay, what counts as doing in meditation? Is kindness a doing? If not, why is it not? So it's a good question. Obviously, you can try very hard to do kindness, and then it becomes probably quite an act of will. But I would say the real kindness is more of a disposition. It's more of a motivation and attitude and intention. So it's a little bit more subtle than a doing. And it's actually less fabricated, as I said before, than those harsh states of uh, mind like ill will and um, cruelty that requires a lot of doing that requires a lot of kind of brewing over negative thinking etc cetera, etc cetera. and kindness to me seems like a sort of natural disposition of the human being like we all suffer and we know that and generally speaking if you look at your life you're generally kind even to yourself you know you feed yourself you go to bed you look after your body as best you can that kindness to me is much less fabricated much less coarse and quite and something quite natural when we stop the will so to me the kindness is more of it's difficult to explain how it works in meditation because obviously when we say you add kindness to mindfulness exactly what does that mean so to me I try and kind of imbue the qualities that I associate with kindness like warmth giving things space opening up softening and it's a very subtle shift in the mind it's a subtle kind of um like, for example, it feels like it's a little bit uh, looser around the object. It's not as tightly grasping. It's kind of soft and just a little bit more spacious. I don't know if that makes sense, but it's up to you in a way to find what that kindness means and how it manifests. And the best way you can know it's kindness is that things start to quieten and things start to feel more peaceful and eased. Even pains in the body start to feel eased by that kindness. And you know what kindness is when someone looks at you with a kindly eyes or you sit with someone and you feel safe. It's those kind of ways of observing yourself and observing your processes inside. Okay, next one. Yeah. In meditation, after a while, there comes bliss and energy. I experience sukha, happiness, contentment and tranquility. I am sinking, it is dark and narrow and calm. And it, then it is getting wide and bright or broad. Bright. Or bright. Can't feel my body anymore, but hearing is there and some little thoughts, and it seems like it, there is someone who watches. I'm not one with the experience. Something to change. Please advise. This is really wonderful stuff. Uh, I did mention that the feelings in the body are one of the difficult of the five senses to suppress and calm down. But then the last of those five senses which disappear is the sound. So a lot of times you won't be hearing much for you know, quite a long time, but the sound can penetrate into the deep meditations. So the body is gone, but you can still hear something. I would not be concerned about that because after a little while, the hearing will disappear as well. For someone who watches, it's just your own mindfulness. I am not one with the experience, but that oneness will actually come. You'll coalesce with what you're aware of. And the one who is just aware, they will actually come together and it's just awareness. Something to change, please advise. Just keep on going, you're doing very well. And after a little while, that the meditation develops. You don't change anything. You just uh, keep on going and find it develops by itself. 
Is it possible for bind streams from different beings to merge when reborn, or do they stay separate from one another? <laughs> so in my understanding, they stay separate. The process of Paticca Samapada, dependent origination, refers to one being. It refers to a process within one entity, if you like, or one um, being, whether it's a human being, and I'm sure it's the same with an animal as well. Maybe it's the same with a deva? Ah, uh, yes. But yeah. remember, sometimes that like another stream of consciousness can enter the same being. It's just like when people sometimes say they have multiple personalities. And I say this because there was one story of a very famous monk, he's still alive, and that they asked him just you now, where was he born? And he said he wasn't born, that there was a little kid in a village in Thailand, and he was only a few years old, and he fell in the water while uh, trying to get some water you know, for the family house, and he drowned. He went deep under the water, and it took him to the villagers all day to find his body. And when they dragged the body out from the spinach pond, miraculously, he came back to life. He survived many hours underwater, which was weird. But then when he came back to life, that he eventually became this great meditating monk and you know, quite famous in Thailand. And they say that's as far back as he can remember. He says, incredible, beautiful rites. Uh, as he was being brought out from this water. He doesn't remember anything earlier. It does seem that streams of consciousness can go into a body if there's a space for it to go into. Mm, but what about when reborn? Because, I mean, it's the same stream of con Well, Yeah, sometimes you can have two in the body, but that means it's a very difficult situation for the person to be in. It's not on the norm. No, oh, not the north, oh no. <laughs> okay. Do you want to do the next one? Oh, up to you. It's a simple one. The differences between volition and will, I would just say just hardly any uh, difference at all. Hmm. Is it not that the chaitanya is more like the motivation where we're coming from, Ajahn? Like, for example, whether we're coming from ill will, meta cruelty or compassion Oy. yeah a lot of questions got hang on yeah uh or what's the other main one the root volitions like greed hate and delusion and isn't it that whale sankara could be far more diverse like there's endless yeah, yeah. manifestations for that no, they have these words in pali abhisan chaitana yeah. and abhisan karoti and they're used almost synonymously okay Isn't volition further back in the chain? Like, isn't volition where you're coming from more than then we, how you react to what's already arisen? I think it's uh, they're pretty much the same. Really? It just, again, it's always how one reacts and what the stream of consciousness does. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you kind of can't say there's a beginning and a... No. Okay, right, I'll try the next one. Can you say something about the importance of regular practice compared to ad hoc practicing only when we feel like doing it? It's important <laughs> to practice as much as you can and yet also not to force yourself when you really, really, really don't feel like doing it because then it becomes a kind of a punishment almost and you might develop a, a negative relationship with practice if you really push yourself too hard but obviously if you do have the motivation to practice regularly and you keep on you know coming back to that mindfulness mindfulness as memory of you know establishing it first of all because mindfulness isn't only something that we're aware of whenever we're aware it's also that faculty of mind that remembers what we're supposed to be doing and so if we can remember throughout the day, you know, that we're supposed to be trying to keep our mind in a wholesome direction, we're trying to be aware of the way we speak and relate to others, we're trying to be aware of how we use our minds and intentions and, you know, align them with the path, then obviously 
the mind is going to be conditioned more and more that way until it becomes very natural. So, for example, if you want to practice metta, loving kindness, and you practice it regularly, even if it's just for five minutes here or there, or even if it's just for like a minute while you're at your computer and you realize I'm getting stressed, I'm getting tight, you know, may I relax, may I be happy, may I be at ease, then you're cultivating that kind of new pattern in your mind and it's going to be much, much easier to connect back to when you need it there. <laughs> so these Brahma Viharas are called divine abidings and that's because they become resorts for the mind you know at first they're like a cultivation it's like a practice that you have to work a little bit hard with just as with your body you know it might be difficult to work out in the beginning but after a while it becomes really easy to um to almost like a default state to go back to those things and so yeah it's really important to practice regularly and in my own practice, I mean, I did make what they call an aditan, like a termination to sit for two hours a day right from the very beginning. And I did it um, because I was motivated, of course, but there were days I didn't really feel like it. But going through that was quite useful to me because I had made a very clear decision. And it meant that I couldn't just run away from my mind when I didn't want to look at it or because it wasn't the state of mind that I felt happy to be with. And it meant that I got to know my mind in so many different moods and make peace with a greater range of emotions, I guess. So then you learn more also about conditions and the way that different conditions affect your mind and what are the most uh, conducive conditions to practice in, for example, what are the conditions that you're likely to start slipping up so there are all kinds of benefits to regular practice but I would say don't set the bar too high because then you'll feel disappointed and discouraged um, just make that regularity as um, what's the word uh, kind of easeful as you can like without too much force so it's something you can you know easily come back to and remember even five minutes is worth it If emotions are natural, what is the purpose of their existence? May they be understood as information or signal from the body, which should lead to a helpful response. For instance, when somebody hurts an animal, other people or me, I feel angry. Should we just simply close our eyes and practice metta? I fear there will be something missing between. Please advise how to understand and react to sadness, fear, and anger. I think when how I would react to sadness, fear, and anger depends which one you're talking about here. A lot of time, like sadness, there is a lot of sadness in that world, and it's a teacher to me. And the sadness which I see in the world, some of it I can do something about if you can. Fine, but sometimes there's nothing you can do. And it gives you a sense of, like, uh, this is the world I've been born into. As we've mentioned in those sutta classes, you know, sometimes the Buddha says that before he was fully enlightened, he saw like an old man, a sick man, a dying man, and then a holy man. It created sadness for him, but from that sadness, uh, he got the motivation to actually to practice and do something worthwhile uh, so that... You couldn't just endure it, but you can actually find a way what its meaning is. And from that meaning, just you know, be relieved from it personally and help other people escape from the sadness of life. And the fear, again, there's different types of fear. A lot of fear is just uh, being afraid to lose something you're attached to. That's why we fear when we go to the doctor, is this a cancer or is this not a cancer? We fear it when we get a message from somebody who might be a soldier in some war zone. All that fear is telling you what you really are attached to. And fear is always fear of losing that. And in the meditation, a lot of times we're afraid because we're losing control. But we're so attached to controlling our lives, thinking that's the only way that we can have uh, uh, less pain and suffering in life. But I always notice that 
Now, we have these stories in the newspapers. A little baby falls from the, the uh, second story of a building and it just bounces. It doesn't sort of break any bones or hardly gets bruised. And the only reason why is because it doesn't know what's going on. The fear doesn't happen. The fear makes you tight. And because it's tight there, then we do get more injuries. But anger itself, I can never see the use for. Every time I've seen anger, if you shout at somebody because an animal is getting abused or a kid is getting abused, the person you're shouting at doesn't actually see what they're doing. They just see your anger and they don't really take it so seriously. If instead of shouting anger at a person, you can be more peaceful and then go up to them and say it, what they're doing. I think there may be a more chance they will hear you instead of just seeing this as another angry person interfere with my what I'm doing. Mm. That's my sort of take on that. Okay. Dear Ajahn Brahma Venchanda, it's wonderful to be on this retreat and much gratitude for this and all your teachings and happy titus. Happy titus. Yeah. I first learned to meditate 30 years ago with TM, and during a one-week retreat, I had experiences that sound like your description of jhana, a bright light, and then it seemed that all sensation, including that of the breath, had ceased, leaving a wonderful nothingness. However, on the last day of the retreat, I was subject to financial and spiritual manipulation, and so stopped using the TM method and mantra. Happily, I soon found a Buddhist group and have since been following the path, but my meditation seemed very shallow, not even delight in the breath. Okay. Do you want to do the first one? Okay. My questions are, were these jhana experiences? They sound like it. So give the benefit of the doubt they were. Can I use another mantra to deeper? Can I just add to the first one, first yeah. of all? Yeah. that I, I feel very sorry that you were exploited and, and manipulated in this way. And I think, you know, having shared that with us, it would seem kind of natural that you might then lose that experience in the sense that it was so closely related to a very unpleasant situation that happened afterwards. And maybe that really shook you. But, and yet, although you're not asking it here, it sounds as though you are wondering why this isn't happening now but I just would like to encourage you to say that your mind knows how to do it and it might be that at that time you know you were feeling very safe until the shock and maybe even trauma of what happened afterwards and this might have knocked you a little bit not your confidence let's say but I think that the mind knows how to do it it's not that your mind is any less pure it may be just that need for being in a safe space again and gradually it will come back. I don't know. That's... Yeah. Can I use another mantra to deepen my meditation and experience John? <laughs> I don't see why not. Yeah, but usually the mantra disappears before yeah. you get to those deeper stages which take you into a jhana. The mantra is like a vehicle. It can take you so far, then you have to get out of that vehicle and use other more refined vehicles to get into the jhanas. Mm. But if the TM mantra still pops into my mind, what should I do when it does? Is it harmful? I wonder if, if it's helpful for you to use some kind of word or phrase that maybe another phrase would be better so that it doesn't have that relation yeah. to the TM. Something that's more meaningful to you, maybe a meta phrase or even just a simple word. I mean, sometimes I like to just use the word peace. And then let my mind follow that direction. And it's just in the beginning, you know, to give some sort of silence and some sort of um, direction to the mind. So I don't think it's probably not harmful, though, is it? No. And this is only what you associate with that word because of previous experiences. Mm. If that previous mantra is associated with those bad experiences, then it's probably best to find another mantra, which still uh, is a, a more uh, conducive mantra for you, a less, which doesn't carry so much baggage with it. Mm. Mm. Just one more thing, though, is that it could be that these mantras seem like a quick way in, 
but it could also be that they create a kind of trance state and that perhaps you become very then dependent on the mantra. Perhaps this kind of method, what I've understood anyway in my own experience with the method, if you call it a method, the way that Ajahn Brahm teaches, it can be slower, but it seems to me that it's more conducive to understanding non-self because the self isn't so active with the process so that when the joy does start to come up, it actually comes up through letting go. I don't know if that makes sense, but for me, that's been a huge difference um, compared to, say, methods where I'm asked to stay with the breath at every cost or to stay um, with a mantra, although I haven't practiced that too much. But it feels um, more like I'm tapping into a natural process of Dhamma that then brings with it a lot more wisdom as well. So I think it doesn't really matter how long these things take. And I have every faith that you will start experiencing joy with the breath. Okay. If letting, <clears throat> if letting go is fundamental to attaining Nibbana, which ones are the most important ones to let go? Thank you, Ajahn and Abhinav Chanda. First of all, let go of wanting so one can have this beautiful contentment in this moment when you're meditating. But then you'll find that you cannot let go of all the wanting. You have to let go of the thing which does the wanting, which is your idea of a self, of who you are. It's a sense of self has to sort of diminish and disappear. And because that's where the wanting and the control and all these emotions uh, are produced from a sense of me and mine and the self. So once that's let go of, then the path becomes very easy. Okay. Okay. What kind of karma can result in the unfulfilled wish to conceive in this life? It does cause suffering despite one seeing the positive part of the experience of having less attachments to relationships to own sons or daughters. So I think the doctrine of karma can be kind of uh, dangerous sometimes when we attribute everything that happens to us now to karma. There might be no karma whatsoever associated with that. It could just be a physiological issue if you like like I don't know if you even call it an issue just a physiological difference uh, that some people have and it might be due to an imbalance in the elements as is understood in the Ayurvedic medicine and that's actually one of the causes that the Buddha said for um, you know for anything that happens he said one of those causes is karma one is weather one is uh like the three humors that they call in Ayurveda, Pitta, Kapha, Vata. So that, I would say, might be part of this cause. I mean, it can be karma, but there's no way you can know. You know, even the Buddha couldn't, maybe the Buddha would know, but even his disciples wouldn't be able to fathom the depth and complexity of karma. So I'm not sure if that's really helpful to think of it that way. I would think of it more in terms of how can I create good karma with this, with what I have because that is what you know, right? You know that, okay, in this life, you have this unfulfilled wish to conceive. How can you make best use of your situation? Like you say, you know, you already have, you can see the potential of having less attachments to relationships. Maybe you could also have other types of relationship, which are even purer and more fulfilling in many ways. So I would see it in that way, because that's the active part of karma that you can influence in your life. Anything else to add to that? I know that many people like, instead of having babies, having fur babies. <laughs> yeah. Those little cats or dogs. They yeah. give you lots and lots of fulfillment. That's true. And you can sleep well at night because they don't wake you up crying. They don't cost a lot of money sending them to school. And uh, they don't cause you a lot of difficulty when they get to be the teenage years. So fur babies have many advantages over a uh, real baby. <laughs> they don't talk either. Yeah, they just <laughs> lick you. <laughs> okay. Uh, next one. To the top. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for the tips for other meditation postures, hurting neck and pain and shoulders. It was very helpful. Great. 
Thank you for your wonderful and sensitive guidance, both Venerable Chanda and Ajahn Brahm during the last five days. You're welcome. I'm glad it worked. <laughs> Shall we read the next? Yeah, go on. During today, the phrases, this is not mine, this is not who I am, appeared easily into my mind a lot. But when it came to an image of my family, I could not get myself to say them. Is there a reason for that? Are there connections with people when love is different from other experiences? When love yeah. different from other experiences in any way? Yeah, I mean, obviously, family is something that we find very difficult not to see as mine because it is, like, conventionally speaking, my family. Um, so it would seem quite natural to me that when it would come to your family, it might be difficult to say that. You might even feel some guilt around that. And it's interesting. I don't know if I should say this on live, but uh, yes, I had that thought today that my family are not really my family. I mean, they are in the role of my family in this life, but how many other families must I have had in past lives too? And how can we really say that they're ours because we don't have any control over them? You know, I mean, parents, I think it must be very difficult to be a parent and to you know, understand that the, the daughter or the son is actually their own being and they have their own karma. You know, if a parent has the dhamma, then maybe this becomes a little easier for them. But, you know, I can't really imagine how difficult that must be when somebody's been a part of your own body, you know, and that's a huge practice. So it's the same with our parents as well. You know, we're kind of part of them. And that's so, also why if a mother or father criticizes you, it's their genes which you've inherited and they've trained you for so many years. So if they criticize you, it's your fault, Mum and Dad. You're the ones who trained me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, it seems nice that you're doing this reflection and over time it you know it starts to permeate a little bit more. But don't push it into areas that it won't go right now. It's okay. <laughs> it's nice when it's natural. Oh, this is a nice question. Go for it. If all that continues is a process after death, what are ghosts and spirits and are they the same thing? As you know that I, I did confess that one of the uh, societies I joined at Cambridge was the Psychic Research Society and we would go hunting ghosts and there were lots of ghosts in UK to hunt and one of the friends over there was... Um, uh, not, not Bernard, no. <laughs> it was one of his bosses uh, who had this wonderful um, business card. He was the head ghost hunter of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. And so we had wonderful conversations. He'd gone to many, many places where things were flying around the room. And you know, he was, but they would never hit anybody. It was one of the weird things. He was a scientist, this was his hobby, and uh, he had much, much information. But he also told me whenever he would go to a place which was supposed to be a haunting, that he would always take a professional magician with him, because the professional magician would could see, he was trained to see how people could be deceived. And he didn't want his uh, best friend, the head ghost hunter, to be uh, deceived. And so there's much evidence you know, for ghosts and for spirits. And a lot of times these are uh, maybe uh, human beings, once they died, that the uh, stream of consciousness continues. And what the Buddha said, they can actually assume a mind-made body. And this is nothing to be scared about because... One of those stories, I don't think I told it here, was of like a friend who was from Essex. Did I tell it here? No. He was from Essex, but he moved over to Perth. And he was a, a shy ranger. He was a policeman before. He was a very down-to-earth fellow. And one night in his home, alone, he woke up middle of the night, turned a lamp on, and at the end of his bed was his mum standing. This was not just a hazy vision. He said it was as clear as if she was solid and real standing at the end of his bed. And she was smiling at him. 
and he was smiling back. He hadn't seen his mother for months because she lived in Essex. He lived in Perth, Australia. And he knew the only way that his mum could be visiting like this was that she was a ghost. It's the only time he's ever seen a ghost. And it was not scary at all. He was just soaking up his mother's love and smiling back at her without any words for five or six minutes. And then she just disappeared. And after she disappeared, uh, he got out of bed, it was the middle of the night, and did what any Englishman would do in such a situation, made himself a cup of tea. And as he was, <laughs> as he was drinking his tea, the telephone rang. It was his sister from Essex. Pete, he said, I've got some bad news. Yes, I know, mum's just died. And his sister was what we call gobsmacked. You know, how on earth did you know that? We've just come back from the hospital. And then Peter just told his sister what had happened. And I asked him many times if I could tell that story to others. He said, oh, please do. It's such a beautiful story. It gave me such solace that even though my mother was on the other side of the world, she'd come to see me just after she died. And we just stared at each other, exchanged our love for one last time. Mm -hmm. This is what happens sometimes if you're fortunate. If you were dying and you wanted to let somebody know just how much you cared for them, to see them one last time, wouldn't you like to do that? A lot of times, though, when people do try to actually see you one last time, you're too afraid. And you just gum yourself up with blankets so you don't have that beautiful experience. So that knows what ghosts are and what spirits are. Just different ways of saying the same thing, mm -hmm. ghosts and spirits. And they're still processes, right? It's still a process, yeah. On to the next one, Jim. Okay. My current boss said to me once that being a good person is not enough to be a leader. <laughs> if you're not a good person and you try to be a leader, then what happens is that people lose confidence in you. You cannot tell other people to do what you're not doing yourself. Uh, there's always that case of, you might know that story of Gandhi when he was uh, studying a law here in England. And his landlady at the time asked him, so can you tell my son not to eat so much sugar? I try and tell him, but my son doesn't listen to me. So Mr. Gandhi said, yes, I will tell him. And a week later, the landlady said, why haven't you told my son? He still eats as much sugar as before. And Mr. Gandhi said, I only told him this morning. Why did you wait so long? And the, Mr. Gandhi said, I had to wait till this morning because until this morning, I hadn't given up eating sugar. I always remember reading that as a kid. You can never tell someone else to do what you're doing yourself. If you are a bad person, you can't be a good leader. People find out about you and you get some sacked. She also mentioned some statements that made me feel really disturbed on other occasions. Could you give me some directions how to deal with those? As a current boss, is sometimes you can change your boss's behavior. And how to change your boss's behavior is a slow process. When your boss says wonderful things, things which you agree with, then let your boss know how much you appreciate that. I said, thank you. I agree with that. That's wonderful. You're so wise, boss. And when the boss says stupid things, ignore them. You <laughs> can't get rid of your boss sometimes, so they can at least tell them what you encourage, what you reinforce, and what you find is just unacceptable. Okay. Is it better to use a mantra such as peace or kindness or even I will die, that's for sure? <laughs> or is it better to try and be open and silently aware? So I think there is no better. <laughs> There's no better or right or wrong in this. It's always about looking at your mind in the present moment and finding out what your mind could really needs. 
So for example, sometimes I start to meditate and my mind's very peaceful already, and then it would feel disturbing to use any kind of word. Other times, you know, maybe my mind's restless and or a little bit tense, and it might be helpful to do some meta practice in the beginning, just with some simple phrases to calm it down and to put a different program in there. Other times I might actually intentionally decide to do some death contemplation. And usually I don't use a mantra for that, but I might do some kind of visualization about, you know, death and imagining myself sort of going through the stages of life and, you know, lying down and actually how it might be to give up the body and to move towards the light. You know, you can be really creative and I think it's important to develop your own practice and not to start evaluating one method as better than another or thinking that if someone does it this way, they must be more advanced because the mind's changing all the time. Time. and uh, it's a very dynamic thing and it's important to learn how to work with the mind in a skillful way so we haven't spoken much here in general about practice outside of a retreat but one of the things that another of my teachers told me that I find really really helpful is to often practice some of the recollections like death contemplation meta meditation um, buddhanusati like recollections on the Buddha, which is something like we did today with Ajahn Brahm. We didn't do a formal kind of uh, meditation recollecting the Buddha's qualities, but we did it internally by trying to actually imagine how it must be to be that content, to be completely content with nothing left to do. So this is a kind of Buddhanusati recollection of the Buddha. There's also Chaganusati, which I've been saying to recollect one's own virtues. There's even Devanusati, which I pretty much never do but it's re recollecting the devas and some people might find that helpful imagining that there are or yeah even if you believe it recollecting that there are these invisible forces that you know are there to rejoice in anything that you do that's virtuous and that help uh, and and kind of um, encourage you on that path so all of these kind of things can be very helpful as part of the practice and I don't know for me I tend to like generally have a couple of main practices which is mainly the anapana and also body contemplation and also some, a lot of metta as well and after some time you just start to be able to ask your mind you know what is it that I need right now so you become skillful with the use of these things so I hope that helps is it essential to create a shrine with a buddha statue and flowers if you wish to progress in the practice I'm a relative newbie and I feel a natural resistance <laughs> to getting a Buddha statue because it makes me think of idolatry. It's in a place like Australia, many people don't understand what a Buddha statue is there for. And when we do three bows, why are we doing three bows? And I explain this uh, to people that uh, what does the Buddha statue mean for you? It's a symbol. It's not an idol. One doesn't worship the idol. One worships what that idol stands for. So when I do my first bow to the Buddha statue, it's always to virtue, to goodness, to trustworthiness, to honesty, because I respect that so much. We don't have many possessions, but I can leave them in this house. They won't be stolen or taken and the virtue of having good friends, which I can trust, is wonderful. So I bow to virtue, I put it above my head when I bow down, and that virtue I find worth in, which is what the word worship means. And the second bow is for peace, as you might call it meditation, but it's more than meditation, it's peace in my own heart and my own body, peace in the monasteries where I live and visit, peace amongst all the friends where I have, even like as far as peace in the world. Peace is a beautiful thing, and it creates just so much harmony and freedom from busyness that I can worship peace really easy. And the third wish, Many people say I should bow to wisdom as the third one, but I prefer compassion and kindness. It's a form of wisdom which you see makes the world so beautiful. Every time you see an act of kindness and forgiveness or generosity when it's unexpected, it just really just makes the heart melt. 
And I worship that so much that my third bow is to kindness. I find worth in it, great worth in it. So those three bows to virtue, peace and compassion, every time I do that, I'm reminded of their importance in this life. And that's why I bow like that. And the story I usually tell is of teaching that in a Christian school in Perth. And the, the head of that Christian school is a very a strict Christian school. But the head of that school, the headmaster, he was so impressed. He came to Bodhinyana Monastery where I lived. And together, myself and the headmaster of this Christian school, we went into the main hall and we bowed three times to the Buddha statue there. He never thought he would ever do that as a devout Christian, but he said he's just bowing to virtue, peace and compassion, like I was. Now it's such an easy thing to bow towards. You may find other qualities which the Buddha inspires you with. Bow to them. It reminded me of their importance every day, every time I bow. Okay, last question, shall we? Go slightly over yeah. time. Do you want to do that one? Oh, why is it that when I come to the stage of breathing and I start to get some pity, some joy, all memories are arising, often related with an ex-girlfriend's friends? How do I overcome this to not blow the feelings away? because I don't want to remember these feelings from the past. I'm not quite sure why you're doing that, but there's an old story there, which it takes a bit too long. But one of the things I tried to blow away the memories of ex-girlfriends, I was a monk, my six range retreat, perfect monastery, getting really good meditation, but then these, uh, these memories of these ex-girlfriends, and with that memory always came was, I wonder if she's still available. I was 23 when I ordained, so this was when I was only 29. I was still handsome and fit, <laughs> but <laughs> sort of. But I was a muck. And so I tried to get rid of these, but they would not get out of my mind. It got worse. And what I did was for one hour every day, I said, this was remembering old girlfriend's time. 3 to 4 p.m. every afternoon. And I went back to my heart and said, whatever thought you want to have in mind, any thought will be welcome. Even old girlfriends, anything. I'm not going to try and stop you. And the weird thing was, it was really shocked me at the time, when I didn't try and get rid of these thoughts or get embarrassed by them, then for that one hour when I allowed them in, only my breath came into my mind. I watched every breath with so much ease for one whole hour. So when those old memories are there, if they want to come in, let them come in. If you let them come in, they will, they will not want to come in anymore. I'm just also wondering if um, it's related to the pity because the pity is a kind of joy and rapture and maybe if the mind's not used to the difference between sensuality and the kind of pity that comes up in meditation it's just an association that you're making and over time that pity will become much more refined and it will start to become more and more mental it actually is a mental quality but at first we still feel it like body shaped and after a while it becomes more disembodied and then you start to feel the difference there. So I don't know if that's also maybe the case that, you know, you're not so used to it, so you're relating it to the past. Should we have the last question, yeah, Adrian? Sure. one more. Hey, here it is. Okay, it's for you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Dear Ajahn Brahm, so far this has been a profound retreat. Focus is becoming sharper and sharper. Senses are becoming softer and a body sense almost disappears. Breath is coming almost unnoticeable. Bright white light appeared, and it got brighter and brighter, almost like moving deep into a bright white cloud. Also heard a deep vibration sound like on. Awareness was moving like an autopilot mode, but was on full alert. I don't know what to call that experience apart from blissful. 
Letting go is great practice. May all beings be happy and peaceful. Much gratitude to you. Yay. Great. <laughs> so very good. Carry on. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> That's Apabhadena Sampadeta, the Buddha's last words of advice. He used to say, strive on with diligence. I retranslated that to very good. Carry on. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> you took out the striving. Yeah. <laughs> Great. So that's it. That's okay. all, folks. So good so night, good everybody. Good night. And, and see you tomorrow if you're still night. here. Lovely and bright. And don't do anything I wouldn't do. <laughs>